Hello, everybody. Welcome back to an episode of Fan Zone Debate. We are here for uh, a, a new title picture, a new bunch of people heading towards the title. And the first matchup of this picture we got is Joe Fairley going up against Rue Moses, both people who have uh, done very well as of late in the league. Rue has consistently done well in this league, has challenged for the belt before, never quite gotten it. But uh, Joe, in his most recent run, uh, doing doing very well, uh, making it to a number one contenders match, earning him spot, to, earning his uh, spot in the seedings here uh, today at the number four seed. So very exciting stuff. But Rue's the number five, no slouch. It's going to be a good one, Mark. You are here. How are you doing, my friend? And what do you think of the matchup? I'm doing all right. Uh, I think uh, got a pretty solid matchup here. We got, uh, I think each of these guys have a nice style. They're, uh, I think, they kind of they're very concise, direct. Uh, should make uh, should make for a neat match. Yeah, absolutely. And Nick Tuig is here, filling in in the judges' spot. Nick, how are you doing? And uh, what do you think of the matchup? Just had a bunch of Chick Fil A. Oh, I'm jealous. It was good. Um, I did you purposely not use the word like tournament or? No, I just, okay. it's a, it is a it's a tournament, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if it is a tournament, uh, I'm excited. Usually, like the middle seeds, four or five, uh, it always makes for a good match, and both these guys have been playing great. Yeah, so we're going to get into it. We're going to start by talking to Rue, who's the lower-seeded player today. Rue, a couple quick questions for you. You're going up against Joe. If this was uh, trivia, I still think you would have an excellent shot against Joe. You guys are two of the best in trivia, but you're also two of the best in debate. But you do have similar styles while also having different strengths. So I think this is going to be a very interesting matchup. Uh, you guys, like are the same, but also aren't at the same time. It's weird. I'm excited. Are you excited to go up against Joe or are you spooked? Um, no, I'm excited. Uh, we have gone against each other in a bunch of different leagues and a bunch of different uh, aspects in terms of debate. So it's nice to, to kind of have a, a, another go with somebody I'm pretty familiar with in this. Um, so I'm excited to see how this goes. Uh, always good to uh, go up against my demolition brother, uh, demolition man teammate. So uh, we'll see how this goes. I'm, I'm excited. Awesome. I'm excited too, Rue. Thanks for being here as we bring in Joe. Joe, are you sleepy or are you ready? Sleepy. <laughs> I'm are you also ready? ready? Yeah, I'm, I, I feel like I'm pretty ready. Yet, uh, I feel like you, you sort of hit the nail head. We do have different strengths, but also I think we do like a lot of the same things. So I like it when not there's not a single thing I have to rewatch because I was like, I've seen everything here. This is great. This is fine. I have an issue with this, especially when one choice is the same movie. So, great. That's fair. Uh, guys, I'm really looking forward to it. Let's get into it. This is how it's going to work. So, we are going to uh, ask the players some questions uh, based off of categories that they drafted. They are going to debate those questions tonight before our very souls, how it's going to work. They're going to get a <laughs> one-minute opening for their argument, followed by a five-minute free form followed by a one minute closing for their argument at the end of the debate mark nick and i will write on our boards who we thought won the debate if you get two out of three votes that wins you the point and the first person to three points wins the match gentlemen are there any questions nope. awesome then let's get into it That clip never gets old. Okay, so the first question is going to come to you from the category of directors. This was drafted by Joe. The question is, which Edgar Wright film deserves a sequel or a prequel? Uh, so we're going to start with Joe. Joe, you get one minute to open your argument when you start talking. I will come in to give you a 10-second warning when the time comes. Sequels and prequels are part and parcel of success. Uh, but the ones that do succeed are where the characters, the story, and the world created by the filmmakers properly justify it. 
When looking at the work of Edgar Wright, to me, only one movie has the characters, the story, and just the, the world that justify that has that ju can justify a prequel or a sequel, and that's Hot Fuzz. Cop movies have always brought sequels and good sequels of that. You look at Lethal Weapon, Bad Boys, Jump Street, Naked Gun, Rush Hour, Police Academy. Uh, the list goes on. Hot Fuzz not only created a wealth of characters that audiences would be happy to see again, but also featured a setting that is well established, has an unseen history, uh, whether it be uh, Frank Butterman's villain origin or the downfall of Sergeant Popwell, or even remove Sanford entirely and have Angel as a youngster dealing with crime in London. Both sequel and prequel, Hot Fuzz deserves it. Time. Okay. Uh, we are going to bring in Rue. Rue, you have one minute to open your argument when you start talking. A lot of Edgar Wright movies are great one-time watches that really do a really good job of establishing themselves. Like, there's not many movies that, like, really lean itself into a sequel. Like, the Cornetto trilogy were movies that weren't really sequels to each other. They just kind of connected. So when I heard this one, I was like, really? Do any of them really need one? And then I thought, what is the one movie that actually has an actual world that has the most interesting future to it? The one that you can actually look into and answer some questions that it's genre or it's, 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 it's story may be interesting in. And the only one that could do that uh, is do that for multiple reasons. A really small one, if you're gonna do something new for Edgar Wright, start the new Cornetto trilogy. And the only way to do that is to start that with Shaun of the Dead. But more importantly, it actually has places to go it's uh John Dead came out at the uh emergence of the zombie fad and really kicked that off. Now that that's died down, we can go into looking into what happens after the zombie apocalypse. What happens in the aftermath of Peg and Frost's relationship in multiple different ways that I don't think Hot Buzz or anything else really has so much to do with. Much to do with straight from the record. Uh we're going to bring in Joe. Guys, you get 5 minutes uh when one of you starts talking, I will throw up the 1 minute warning when the time comes. I will come in for the 10 second warning as well. If I feel like uh, a point has been going on too long, I'm going to throw up the let's move on. And if I feel like you aren't shutting up, you're not letting your other player talk. I'm going to throw up the let your opponent talk. If you're still not listening, I will send Nick, send Nick Tuig to your house. Don't make me do that. It'll be very upsetting for all of you. So uh, five minute free form when one of you starts talking. Well, Frost is a zombie at the end of Shaun of the Dead, you know, Ed, is a Ed, Ed has become a zombie, and it is established that they only retain basic motor function skills. All he can do is play Time Splitters 2. That is literally all he can do. Uh, that's the thing. That's what they say at the end of the movie. But it's been so long. What happens after? Are they going to say, okay, maybe it's years after. What's the aftermath of having to deal with your best friend being a zombie in the rest of the world? Or maybe you can go down the line of maybe they found a cure. What happens when he comes back? There are multiple ways you can go into seeing what happens after that. You didn't tell me whether we're having a prequel or sequel to Hot Fuzz because... None of them is interesting at all. Which way are you going to go? You can't really answer that question solidly because going before leaves you uh, getting rid of everything that's great about Hot Buzz. And going after, it's just going to be serializing buddy cops, which we've seen everywhere else. I'm actually doing something with the zombie genre. You're doing something we've seen again and again and again. I fundamentally disagree with that. You can... You can, do two, you can go two ways with it. This thing, it deserves a sequel or a prequel. In a prequel, you can look at what happened in Sanford. What happened to get these good cops, what happened to get them into a pit where they were just so blasé about everything, believing everything was an accident. You can explore the downfall of Frank Butterman. You can explore how Sergeant Popwell came to meet his end. Or you can go outside of Sanford and bring Nicholas Angel on his own. It doesn't necessarily have, you don't have, you can get rid of that buddy cop. You don't have to do that. Buddy cop has been done for, but you can get rid of that. Or you can see where these characters go from there with Nick Angel as an inspector, with Danny Butman as a sergeant, maybe bringing in a new breed of cops, a new to sit and bring into this world that Nick has created. There are many different ways you can go. Once you cure it, it's not really a sequel to Shaun of the Dead anymore because you're getting, once they cure it, you're getting rid of the zombies. 
but again, it, it is the sequel of Shaun of the Dead. Maybe it's Shaun of the uh, whatever kind of title you want to do. There's still the whole thing of we don't know what the cure happens. You don't know if you're going to make a cure, what's going to happen after the cure. Are there side effects? Are there things that are going to be different? Have there been such a long time frame in between? What is that like with um, uh, what's his face coming back from being a zombie? There's so many actual interesting concepts you can make. Um, you can't do a prequel to uh, uh, Hot Fuzz because then either you don't have Angel at all and that kills the dynamic between Peg and Frost or um, you you bring Angel back and we go into looking at him being a tight ass. He hasn't changed at all. Or you go into looking at Sanford just going into what they already are beforehand. There's no tension. There's no drama. There's no nothing. We already know where they're going to. And then if you uh, uh, do a sequel, again, serialization of the same buddy cop things in a new place with a new team. Nothing is different. If you do a prequel, you lose what make Hot Fuzz great. If you do a sequel, it's nothing new. There's so many different ways you can look into where Shaun of the Dead could go. You got plenty of ideas, and Edgar Wright, being a very intelligent writer, can make it really interesting with the circumstances and aftermath of the decision to keep him alive. One of the key things of the corners are true. You're talking about where these characters go from here. I'm, you're not just saying what happens when he's cured. Well, there's no zombie, so it doesn't really feel like a sequel to Shaun of the Dead. One of the great things about the Cornetto trilogy is that it has a really good way of reflecting sort of the age of its stars. You've got Shaun of the Dead, you've got that sort of man-childness. Then you've got the two serious and, you know, and then you've got, he sort of over the hill, hasn't achieved what he wants to do. So now you could further that into the Cornetto quadrilogy by having this sort of wise, wise sage passing on what he's learned to somebody new. You know, a young Nicholas Angel, on the other hand, with a prequel, while not being part of the Cornetto series, gives us something new, gives us something new about that character, how he went from someone who was new coming in into that person that he becomes when he is promoted to sergeant. You see that around him, you, see, you hear very brief things about the things he's dealt with, but you don't really see enough of them. You know, a British, you still talk about all these buddy cop movies, but a British cop movie has not been done since Hot Fuzz. So you want to see Angel become a dick and have nobody around him to bring that buddy cop formula that made Hot Fuzz so great. Um, and you keep bringing up the cure. I'm not saying that's what we do. I'm saying there's so many options of what you can do because Edgar Wright can make um, really great stories out of relationships and what happens. You talked about characters. Well, um, uh, Simon Pegg's character is starting to get his shit together, but then he has this weight next to him of either his zombie friend or after his zombie friend comes back after being basically frozen in time, what's that relationship gonna be like? What's that gonna do to him as he's trying to grow? The, again, so many options for Shaun of the Dead while Hot Fuzz cuts off a prequel or sequel, whatever Hot Fuzz was at its knees. It's a completely different film that doesn't bring forth or bring back what Hot Fuzz was in the first place. It's not because it's still cops in a rural setting or in an English setting trying to solve crime. That's basically what it is. But what yours, yours, yours gives us two options. It is zombie who can't do anything or no zombies at all. Zombie movies are played out just as much as cop sequels right. anyway. All right. Uh, we are going to start closings with Rue. Uh, Rue, you have one minute to close when you start talking. Joe keeps getting stuck on no zombies or whatever, and that's not the point. The point is the aftermath of zombies. We've seen zombies. Again, that's why it was a fad, and that's why it started off the craze. Now it's died down. We've never seen the aftermath of zombies. That's a great sequel to go into something new and some a, a direction that zombie movies haven't gone into. What happens after the threat is done in this really small, really contained relationship between Simon Pegg and uh, Nick Frost's characters? Whereas any sequel or prequel to Hot Fuzz, you either dissolve the chemistry between those two because you can't follow both Angel and uh, Butterman at the same Butters at the same time if you do a prequel, or you do something serialized as a sequel. You just go to a new town with a new team and a new thing to solve. It's not really something that deserves a sequel. It'll be fun, sure. It's Edgar Wright, sure. But when we talk about deserving, we want something that is going to give us something new and grow it. And that is going to happen with Shaun of the Dead and the so many different ways you can go into making the world of zombies something new and different. Time. Okay. Uh, we're going to move over to Joe. Joe, you have one minute to close when you start talking. At the end of the day, you can pitch a sequel to a movie based on the fact that the genre has always lent itself to sequels and leave it at that. Or you can explore why the characters and the world created by your movie justify an audience revisiting it, revisiting that world. With Hot Fuzz, you have the options. Hot Fuzz created these things that justify being revisited because of the film being one open-ended. You do not know. You can have 
Nicholas Angel as the inspector, Frank, uh, Danny Buckman as the sergeant, looking at these new cops, or are they dealing with something new together? Don't forget, most of the leaders of that town were out. And now, what's going to come in now? What is next? With Shaun of the Dead, you are left with that. You literally explained in the film that the zombies only retain their autonomy. So either it's going to be Simon Pegg doing all the work while Danny Buckman bashes at buttons, or while Nick Frost bashes at buttons, or you're going to get a sequel, which, to be honest, sounds quite depressing. The aftermath of this, the Cornero trilogy itself lent itself to exploring the ages of these characters as the movies developed, and that's why the Hot Fuzz is better, because you can have this wise old sage. Time. Okay. I'm going to bring in Mark. I'm going to bring in Nick. We made Mark disappear. Um, okay, I'm ready. If the other judges are ready. Okay. okay. Uh, I went with Joe. Um... I thought this was good. Good start. Um, it started out a little slow for me, um, but I thought that um, by the midpoint, both had kind of given me a good idea of what their movie would be. And I think Joe's closing was really, really strong where he just said at the end of the day, like, no matter what you do with uh, a Hot Fuzz, or I'm sorry, a um, Shaun of the Dead sequel, um, it sounds like what Rue would be pitching would be more depressing than fun and even if you take the zombies out of it it doesn't sound like it would be even though it would be the same characters and stuff wouldn't be a, a like a sequel in the same vein as something like a hot fuzz prequel or sequel that would retain the like cop in um in uh the uk type of thing so i went with joe but again i thought rue did a really good job i actually thought his pitch sounded really interesting so uh mark uh where is your vote going oh yeah no i like this one even though i feel like the obvious answer is world's end i mean i'd watch simon Pegg go around with his young buddies just starting bar fights like come on baby driver um <laughs> uh, i didn't go with rue though um I I really kind of grasped onto Rue's argument of of Hot Fuzz poss maybe not it being that, but there's a greater possibility that Hot Fuzz becomes something overly generic and just something that we've seen before. And where even though like Shaun of the Dead, I think doing a sequel to Shaun of the Dead would be really weird. It does sound like something that hasn't been done before. And I think kind of more, uh, more, I think it kind of, it, it answers more of the question of what deserves a sequel or prequel. All right. That's fair. All right, Nick, you get to decide this one. Um, I picked a person who made arguments that I agreed with more. Nice. Um, yep. Uh, no, basically, what it came out, I, I, with Mark, I thought Rue was, that was a good point for Rue to bring up, and then Joe said something, like, right at the end, before you said time, and they went into the one minutes, but he was like, cop genres are played out, like, zombie genres are more, more played out. I was like, good point. That kind of just got rid of what Rue was holding on to for me. Uh, and Joe didn't fall into the trap of, like, actually pitching a film. He was like, you could do a prequel about the town, you could do a prequel about the person, you could do a sequel with the relationship still, and it's a proven thing to work. So that's why I voted for Joe. Okay. All right. So Joe wins the first point, um, but still anyone's game as we get into the next category, which was drafted by Rue in the category of Law and Order, the fandom category of Law and Order. And the question is... What is the best action scene in a Bad Boys movie? I'm excited for this one. The trailer for the new Bad Boys movie just dropped. I'm excited. Uh, I'm all hyped on Bad Boys now. So uh, let's talk about it. Rue, you get to go first. You have one minute to open your argument when you start talking. 
when you look back at the Bad Boys films, we love the how the action and the comedy uh, blending together to make really over the top great scenes in those original movies until you realize and watch that Michael Bay is a shit director. He edited and cutted the shit out of that thing. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is horrible to look at. So when Adil and Bilal went into Bad Boys for Life and actually took everything we love from the Bad Boys films, the big, blusterous, uh, comedic uh, action scenes that were out of this world and actually let you see them. That is why I chose, uh, they made something great. And that is why I chose the motorcycle chase scene uh, uh, against Zuelo and Bad Boys for Life. You got car crashes, shootouts, Gatling guns. You got comedic scenes with the pit bull, comedic scenes between um, Mike and Marcus. You got uh, bazookas. You got sidecar shenanigans. You got a uh, helicopter chase. And you got an ending, which makes Armando an even more uh, villainous, villainous, scary character that makes you feel the fight you have against them. It is absolutely amazing time okay uh we're gonna move over to joe joe one minute when you start talking the law and order category is full of great action movies multiple great action sequences so for me the final action set piece of an action movie has to be the best to really make a movie great and that's why i picked the final battle in the abandoned hotel from bad boys for life uh, bad boys for life is a fantastic legacy sequel culminating in a palm sweating heart rate increasing shootout that is epically shot epically choreographed scored and performed it pushes mike and marcus to their limit both physically and mentally and also gives this new generation of miami metro officers a chance to shine the whole course of the movie sets up this sequence not just the story but the journey these characters are going on there's mike's emotional journey from being shot to finding out he has a son that he has to fight against you've got marcus's battle with sort of being over the hill you've got armando coming to terms with the truths of his family isabella's quest for revenge dawn's struggle with violence uh, isabel's quest for revenge um all the and Rita's quest for leadership, all of these play out in a resolution that is a 10 minute thrill ride. All right, five minute freeform when one of you starts talking. Everything you just talked about is in action. It's the soap opera drama of the last eight minutes of your film. Those last eight minutes of that film is literally us watching Will Smith and Martin Lawrence be Liam Neeson and taking three because they should have got their ass whooped. And I don't know how they are still alive. It's Martin Lawrence saying, stay down with your wit's ass. That is not a great line at all. And then it's literally, Will Smith does a punch, stares in the mirror. Then another punch. And then he tries to dramatically talk to Armando about being his son. And then he gets hit again. And then uh, Mike and Marcus stare at each other for another 45 seconds. And then one more thing. And then it's the slow motion shot of Armando getting shot by his mother. It is soap opera dramatics with horrible fire CGI that looks absolutely ridiculous and horrible. That is not an action sequence. It's horrible compared to the actual action and comedy that keeps building and building and building in my five minutes of a great action scene. Your five minutes of a great action sequence, which includes a whole minute of deciding who is going to is is. Uh, Marcus and to actually get on this bike in the first place. You know, it lingers under that bridge for far too long. Most of the action at the beginning is confined to Marcus whining and Mike quipping inside the car before they even get to the motorcycles. You know, it lingers with Mike trying to convince Marcus to get in the bike. Let's take another 20, 30 seconds to convince Marcus to actually use the weapon on the bike in the first place. When we actually get to the action at some point, at least mine has action. You've got Mike and Marcus doing the action. You've got that great scene from Dawn. You've got him taking out the pillar. You've got, um, Rafe controlling the drone, taking out the bad guys. You've got the helicopter crash. They're talking about it's not action. There is plenty of action in that sequence. You've got plenty, but yours just it has a little bit of action and then it lingers. A little bit of action, then it lingers. You base sorry, hold on. You you forgot to mention the first two minutes of your scene, which is actually really great because it shows the ammo team. But then the ammo team disappears because it's not about them. And then after that, it's literally nothing. You seem to forget that the bad boys are an action comedy and the comedy is there to build the action as it goes along. We start with the car crash. Then we go to the shootout with ammo. And then we have a great comedic scene of the pit bull in the, in the, uh, in the uh, car and uh, the Martin head. having, but uh, again, the comedy and action build each other. So you're waiting to see if he gets in and that takes about 20 seconds. Then they get in and start shooting. You get the, uh, you get uh, Mike grabbing a grenade, throwing it at the motorcycle, motorcycle doing a wheelie, throwing it back, leading into then um, the great slow motion slot of Will Smith shooting back with the machine gun. Then you got him under the bridge. Um, and then you got him under the, uh, the truck and uh, the great comedic timing of him trying to get out of there. Then you have, again, you brought up the 
Gatling gun. That thing between Mike and Marcus is absolutely hilarious talking about it's a Gatling gun for God. It allows the action, the action to take a quick breather, to have the comedy build it up and then continue on to more action while yours is literally stop and stare. One yeah. punch, stop and stare. One more punch, stop and stare. And the last two minutes of them walking out of the hotel, there is no action. Because that the action sequence has finished. Yours does not need to take any more breathers by the time it gets to the under the trucks. And it has had plenty of breathers. Like I said, you've got the bit in the car at the first place before the, before the mo other motorcyclists get there. You've then got the whole bit of Marcus trying to poke the big lump on Zuelo's head. All right. The thing is, you still get the comedy in my scene, which is an action comedy. You've got Marcus with the glasses while they're also rolling that table at the same time whilst being shot at. You've got this fantastic long tracking shot throughout the hotel showing all the members of Ammo and Mike and Marcus all doing stuff together. You know, you've got the, the fire raising the stakes even more. By the point, time you get to this point in the movie, the stakes have already been raised because Mike has been shot and you've had um, Captain Howard taken out. And I know that happens before your scene, but the difference is your scene happens with an hour left of the movie. You know nothing's going to happen. But in this scene, it's a legacy sequel. So there is a re very real possibility that something's happening to Mike, something's happening to Marcus. And throughout that action sequence, you feel it. You can feel it every time because they have been over the hill for part of this movie. And that's what's so great about it. But you've also got these other characters having these great action sequences, these great stunts, great action, the fire coming in, the crash of the helicopter. But what your scene does is it gives you a little bit of action and then takes a breather for some comedy. A little bit of action, action, takes a breather for some comedy, but mine is action, 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 comedy throughout the action, and that's what makes it better. It's 10 minutes of thrill. You brought up ammo, and they're in the first two minutes, and then, again, literally everything you mentioned, the only extra action there is the, uh, is the helicopter crashing, and again, it is killed by horrible CGI. I haven't even mentioned the second half of my scene yet. The Zuelo thing is before the action even starts. That's not a part of my scene. Uh, again, after the Gatling gun for God, then you go into them separate, um, uh, Armando coming in in a helicopter with the bazooka, the bazooka firing and them separating. So you got a, uh, uh, a, a sidecar without a, um, without a driver and more shootouts with the motorcycle. And then, uh, Will Smith hits the back of the truck. Zuelo, uh, runs up the ladder. He follows behind him. And just when you think the uh, Armando is going to shoot him, uh, Mike, uh, Marcus comes back and shoots him with the Gatling gun. Uh, uh, Armando shoots Zuelo to kill him and Mike falls into the ocean. Uh, there are two comedic scenes in my entire five minutes. Time. All right. We are going to start with Joe on closings. Joe, you get one minute to close when you start talking. The best action scenes are the ones where the stakes are at its highest. The action is at its highest level without being ridiculous and comes to a satisfying conclusion. The final battle scene of Bad Boys for Life manages to give all those things while also giving every character, including the villains, a chance to shine. Compare it with a short chase sequence, which adds nothing to the development of the characters and focus mostly on the main characters arguing with one another with brief moments of action. The final battle scene is not only thrilling to watch, it's constructed in a way that allows the audience to follow the action, unlike Taken 3, uh, and also understand why each shot, each explosion, and each punch is needed for the first time in the franchise. It has a fantastic transition from the shootout with the ammo team going into these more personal fist fights. You've got the one between Marcus and Isabella, which is brutal and brief, and then you've got that really brutal emotional fight scene between Armando and Will. And for the first time in the franchise, with this action scene, you genuinely fear what you're going to do when they come for you. Time. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> we're going to bring in uh, Rue. Rue, one minute when you start talking. That final action sequence is 20% and two minutes of great action and 80% of eight minutes of soap opera drama that Joe calls stakes with old ass Will Smith and Martin, and Martin Lawrence not being able to keep up with any of the action you're actually looking for. While mine's is five minutes of car crash, ammo shootout, machine guns, then the comedic bit with the pit bull, which is hilarious. Then you go into the motorcycle chase. Then you got Will Smith throwing a grenade and the motorcycle doing a wheelie, grabbing it and throwing it back. And then you got the Gatling gun for God's uh, 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 hilarious conversation between two. That is the second comedic uh, break for 30 seconds each in five minutes, a minute out of the five going into then Marcus almost getting beheaded by a truck. Then uh, the uh, helicopter coming in with Armando and the bazooka and then them having to separate the car and the motorcycle and then the great slow motion scene behind that and then uh hitting the back of a truck and racing up against the helicopter and then armando shooting way low and before shooting will smith marcus shoots him with the gatling gun that is nothing but action upon action upon action nice. building to a great 
building to a great strike it from the record. Gentlemen, please. All right. Good stuff. We can all agree, though. Bad Boys for Life is like awesome, right? Like, I love that movie. 100%. I think it's I. I saw that with Tyler Butler in the theater on like a Sunday night, and the two of us were like, "What? Why was this so good? Like, what?" <laughs> I do think the new one looks really fun too. So, is it the same directors? Does anyone know? I think so. Okay, cool. I don't see why not. It's they they uh people have been talking about how uh Batgirl should have been uh shouldn't have been dropped. So yeah, it's the same guys who who did that. Oh, that's right. I forgot that they were gonna do yeah, that's right. Okay, anyway. Yep. Um Nick and Mark, you ready? Yep. Okay, Nick, you're going first. I find myself conflicted. So um Joe's opening happened. And Anna is sitting in bed with me, and I, I, I said, Anna, everything you just said wasn't about the action. And then Amaru came in and said, everything you just said isn't about the action. And I was like, he's right. But um, then the fight went on, and Joe convinced me that what he said at the beginning was important. That action scenes need action, but also like emotions behind the action, like caring about the characters and the situations they're in adds to the, the overall goodness of the scene, whatever scene it may be, whether it's action, whether it's whatever. Um, and Omaru, while I thought, did a very good job and found myself side with him for a lot of it. Um, there were times where I thought Rue stumbled and was like, well, all this scene I just, everything I've just been talking about isn't even part of my scene. Like, I haven't even gotten to the second half of my scene yet. And then, and maybe, maybe Rube misspoke, so I was kind of like, I, I don't yeah, know, but um, he, he's, you said something like everything, that's not even part of my scene, the like Pitbull thing, but regardless, um, there was also some contradictory about whether or not the comedy was important, because he's like, it's an action comedy, but then he was like, but there's only a little bit of comedy. And so ultimately, Joe really convinced me that the stuff with the ammo uh, people is very good, the the... And the and all the motivations, and I thought this was a weird weird way to go about things. But pointing out that you're more worried in this because of the fact that it's a legacy sequel, and you're not actually sure what could happen, I was like, that's kind of a good point, and I think it has swayed me. So I voted for Joe, even though I am surprised at myself. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, I went with Rue. Um, I think that a lot of the stuff you said because i said Rue. Uh, <laughs> uh a lot of the stuff you said nick that that adds up i did like that hit the legacy sequel thing um i didn't see it as a hit as much as a like um uh just like beefing up of joe's argument not to say that you said that nick i just i, I said it to myself um but i thought that rue really did convince me that his scene what in an action comedy um has the best of both worlds um and not that the category is action comedies or anything <laughs> like that but he convinced me that you go to these movies for certain things you get all of it and he actually also really convinced me that joe's like drama and everything like behind it um that nick was talking about and that joe was talking about um, was actually kind of soap opera ish and melodramatic and not that great. Um, but I, I got, I understood what Joe was going for. It just didn't totally work for me the way that it like surprisingly worked surprisingly in his own words worked for Nick. So, uh, I went with Rue, uh, but I thought that both did a great job and Mark, this one's up to you. Um, so far you're the outlier. Are you the, uh, <laughs> what, what what are you doing here? Oh, yeah, I, I guess I can't be the outlier. You can't be um, anymore. So, um, yeah, I I will agree with Nick in this in this one instance. I felt for about half of this fight, both people were making the same counter argument against the other movie, which I thought was weird, and it threw me for a bit. Um, 
And then I, where I lean to my decision was what, what is just the plain, just from what it, from what either of these people are saying, what is just the best action movie? And not only that, what is just the best action scene in a bad boys movie in a bad boys context? Like what feels more like that? And I think Rue did that at least in the bad boys context and what the way he was, the way he explained the scene and kind of the, like in the way he explained the scene, kind of how he attacked Joe's scene by the end, that Joe's scene doesn't feel like it fits like a good action, actually in the bad boys and his does. Okay. All right. So that means that uh, Rue wins the point and we are going to move on to the next question and we are all tied up. So uh, the next question, question is going to come in the category of jimmy b james bond i'm actually looking forward to this one even though it's a very simple question of which pre craig bond film has the best villain very simple question but also lots of options lots to choose from joe we're going to kick it off with you one minute when you start talking oh please james spare me the freud i might as well ask you if all the vodka martinis have ever silenced the screams of all the men you've killed, or if you find forgiveness in the arms of all those willing women, all the dead ones you failed to protect. This line alone shows why Alec Trevelyan from Goldeneye is the best villain. One that truly understands Bond. Not only that, Trevelyan is a character that hits all the points of what makes a great Bond villain. Uh, he's Bond's equal. He has an intimidating hench person a scary piece of tech, believable motivations that work in direct opposite of Bond's goals. Alec Trevelyan matches Bond both physically and mentally. Before that, you would have maybe a villain that would match physically with a hench person that matched mentally or the other way around. But Alec Trevelyan is a double threat. He knows Bond almost intimately, and that makes him the best villain. Time. Okay. We're going to bring in Rue. Rue, you now have one minute when you, when you start talking. Sorry. There are many great movie villains, but there's something that hits different when you put Bond in front of the word villain, and it completes, uh, creates something completely different. A Bond villain is outrageous, outlandish, over the top, has great quips, has great quotables, uh, and has the great perfect amount of camp to match Bond's amount of camp because that's what you want to see. You want to see that kind of equal equalness uh, of, of Bond's character being uh, matched by a villain. And uh, Bond villains became Bond villain because of the gold standard that was set by Auric Goldfinger. The man is absolutely the most uh, intelligent, ruthless, but scheming, most quotable, best vi Bond villain in the entirety of Bond. Uh, before him, you kept him in the shadows or you had somebody that was almost the main villain, but wasn't. And after him, everybody tried to emulate the epicness and the quotables that is. Do you want me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. All right. Two great picks, gentlemen. Five minute free form when one of you starts talking. Yes, I screwed up at the beginning of that quote, but go ahead. Wrong, wrong gold standard. It's golden eye as the gold standard. Look, you've got a great memorable quote in there. I'll give you that. That is the Bond villain quote, but that's pretty much about it. You try to remember anything about gold things, real plan. Everyone thinks he's, everyone misremembers. He's trying to rob Fort Knox. Not. Um, the thing is, this is Bond. Alex Rowling was Bond's friend first. That sets him apart. You talk about all the other villains trying to emulate Goldfinger. So one thing Alex Trevelyan isn't trying to do, there is no emulation there. This is a completely original villain. Nothing from the books. This is something completely different. And it works. Sean Bean does such a fantastic performance. You get everything in there. You get a history. You get great hench people, great tech, great death. Everything about Alex Trevelyan sets him apart, but also he hits all, he ticks all the right boxes for a Bond villain. I knew from the get-go that you were going to pick the one great Alec Trevelyan scene in the entire movie because I was like, that's the only thing I remember from him. Sean Bean makes this a great villain. Alec Trevelyan is not a great Bond villain. There is not much memorable about him. You talked about his henchmen. His henchmen outshined him as Bond villains. Anatop and Boris are more memorable. You talk about physically and mentally uh, capable to, 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 to beat Bond. Bond won that fight. 
hands down. That's why Alex Trevelyan is dead. Uh, and and the not uh, uh, sure. Maybe it's original, but the fact that it's done better in Skyfall as a uh, um, a double O who went rogue makes you feel like Alex Trevelyan in itself is not a great Bond villain. I'm sorry, Goldfinger not only has the quotables, but the ruthlessness of painting somebody in all gold, the intelligence to kill out a whole mob boss people he's with in in one stroke. And you talk about people forget his plan. That's the point. Goldfinger doesn't want you to know his plan. Alex Trevelyan's plan wasn't world domination like most Bond villains. It was to rob a bank. Goldfinger wanted you to think he was robbing the bank when in fact he was actually making the economy go down and make gold worthless. That's how smart he was and how smart he was to have somebody like Oddjob as his henchman to help with the physical stuff because, but not have a henchman that outshines him. Alex Trevelyan is a fine villain, not a great Bond villain, while uh, Goldfinger is the Bond villain. We're not really going to talk about henchmen out shiny when your henchman is literally odd job, one of the most memorable villain uh, henchmen of all time. But let's go back to Alex Trevelyan because it's not just about robbing the bank. It is about destroying Great Britain. That is what his motivation comes from. It's about the betrayal of his parents. You have that whole scene in the sort of the um, the abandoned statue uh, yard before he puts Bond in the Tiger helicopter. He talks about how his parents survived the British betrayal and then killed themselves on that. That drove him. You talk about he forces Bond to go to the limit on multiple occasions throughout those fights. You know, he makes him steal a tank. He makes Bond call his bluff on the train when threatening to kill Natalia. You know, bestening him one on one in a fight. It's only because Bond kicks that ladder out at the last second that he avoids being shot on that satellite, making him feel guilt about his death, his fake death for nine years this affected bond no other villain has ever had that kind of effect on bond once goldfinger is done it's forgotten about but you see that with the beginning just that very first part of that scheme with alec that he makes him feel that guilt and then brings it all back piles it on bests him in that fight that is one of the most brutal fights between bond and a bond villain ever that fight on the satellite the blood the punches just how close quarters is how brutal it is no Bond villain has ever come close to matching that kind of brutality with Bond. All of those things you just mentioned, if you didn't tell me the name Alec Trevelyan, I wouldn't know it was from a Bond film. Uh, Again, Sean Bean, being the great actor that he is, is able to elevate this character with his performance, while the character of Art Goldfinger is able to elevate somebody like Gert Frobe uh, that nobody knows because the character itself is so damn memorable and so damn scheming and so damn intelligent. The back and forth that he's able to do with Bond in the golf scene, in the golf scene is absolutely hilarious, G- getting you to the set of why he wants that revenge. The, the subtlety after the great line saying goodbye, Mr. Bond and leaving shows you his death. Again, covering somebody in entire gold. You talk about Ajab. Again, the intelligence to have a henchman as memorable as Ajab, but still not be more memorable than the villain himself because he does everything he needs to be scheming, to be reprehensible, to almost get away with it and uh, and leave when he needs to, if not for his other amazing um, uh, henchwoman in Pussy Galore. He is the ultimate Bond villain because he is four, five, six steps ahead or is able to get away with his intelligence and anything he doesn't have, he knows who to get rid of it. I cannot tell you what happened with Alec Trevelyan uh, if you didn't really bring it up because all I think about is Sean Bean's performance. I think that's that's the biggest issue here is that, is that Goldfinger only matches Bond on a mental level, not on a physical level. But Alec Trevelyan has that double threat. You've got the physical and you've got the mental. And let's talk about the best one of the best parts about being a Bond villain is having a great death. And Goldfingers feels rather unceremonious just being sucked out of that plane at the end. But with Alex Trevelyan, you get that final fight on the bottom of the satellite, the grabbing of the foot for England James, no for me, being dropped and then having the whole satellite, his whole world basically crash down upon him with that final scream. Time. Okay. Uh, Rue, we're kicking it off with you first for closings. You get one minute when you start talking. If you become the most memorable villain in an entire franchise without even being able to physically fight somebody because you are intelligent enough to know that you have henchmen that can do that who don't outshine you, that is more powerful than somebody who is an equal to, a quote unquote, equal to the main character, but basically just the same person with a better uh, actor behind the scenes to elevate a regular main villain that I can't remember mostly anything about past 
Sean Bean. You talk about the death. How about talking about the fact that he's able to get away three, four, five times before he, that death scene of getting sucked out the window because he is so intelligent enough to be able to know when he uh, is able to live to fight a, another day. Goldfinger is the gold standard of what a Bond villain is. Memorable, outlandish, over the top, campy. Alec Trevelyan is a great villain that if you didn't say Alec Trevelyan too, you would not know he was a part of the Bond series at all. And that's what makes Goldfinger the best Bond villain. While Alec Trevelyan, he's cool. Time. All right. Joe, we're moving over to you. One minute when you start talking. When looking at what makes a great Bond villain, you need a mix of things. You need that believable plan, a good hench person, strong motivation, and to be able to physically and mentally match Bond. Alec Trevelyan not only ticks all of these boxes, he is unique in that he knows Bond. He was his friend. Knowing that Bond was 006, we know that he is on Bond's level from the start. Goldfinger may have a clever clever plan, but in the, in the end, it's kind of easily stopped by Bond. Odd job is more memorable. Blofeld is the Bond villain you think of. But again, the, there isn't that physical and mental match with Bond that Alec Trevelyan has. Alec stands out from the crowd because he is the only villain that matches Bond in every way. The quote I opened with shows more than any other quote how much Alec understands Bond. And that makes him a more scary villain because you are, you've are you seen Bond through all these years. You've seen everything Bond is capable of. And knowing that Alec is a double O as well, you already know. From that instant he's called 006, you know that he is capable of everything that Bond is. And you see it in the fight. You get that great death. More than just one memorable quote. For England, James, no for me. Time. Oh, boy. It's almost like these two have been stuff, random man. champions before. <laughs> Good stuff. It's almost like these two know what they're talking about. Okay. Hang on. All right. Uh, okay. Mark, you are kicking this one off. All right. Uh yeah, I'm not really good leading up with these. I, I, I went with Joe. Um, it's funny because I, I believe that not that long ago, Joe had a fight with uh, Joe, played Jacoby, and I, I believe it was believe it was you, Joe, because you, because there was a point where I think it, whatever question it was, you kind of threw a bunch of stuff at Jacoby. And then Jacoby kind of answered every every one of your counterpoints. And I thought that was a great way of handling it. And I think kind of the opposite happened here, where I feel like Rue threw a whole bunch of stuff at Joe. And I think Joe had counterpoints for pretty much everything. And like I and I don't even really like Goldeneye all that much, but I feel like just kind of hearing Joe th talk about Gold Golden and Alex Trevelyan and Goldeneye just made me think, okay, like I mean. He does kind of the real deal. Then he just, in all in all, just Joe really sold me on the argument. And also how Alec is that dual threat. And that's something that we don't really see in a ton of these Bond films. Okay. Nick. <clears throat> I was, I don't know. I was really torn even like a minute after they were done talking. Um, and it kind of felt like they were fighting two different fights. Like, Joe was like, who's the best villain for X reason? And Rue started off by saying, like, Bond villain kind of means something different. And this is what that means. And here's why Goldfinger fits it. I think what I would have liked to hear is how, which I didn't hear from anyone, is how the villains matched up well against their Bond because they fought two different Bonds. And I, I thought, I think they like, 
I thought that would have helped. Where I wound up leaning, and it's literally like 5149, which I'm sure has been said a hundred times uh, on this, but um, I would have liked to hear more things against Goldfinger that I didn't hear. Like, um, he's not a physical threat. Great. That's why he's got odd job. Um, he's 10 steps ahead of the game. I would have loved to hear, okay, how come all of the soldiers knew to like pretend to fall asleep because they didn't put the get like, I think there were shots against Goldfinger that I didn't hear, and I heard shots against Alex, so I voted for a mark. I hate this. Um, I agree with Mark. I don't really like Goldeneye all that much. Am I the only one? Like, everyone loves that movie. I think it's fine. Like, Sean Bean's really good. Pierce Brock. I like it when he's upside down in the toilet at the beginning. That's fun. Um... I, yeah, I don't know. I, I really like Goldfinger too. That movie is, I, I'm a big fan, um, especially when he smacks that ass in the beginning. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. Um, no, this was really good. I'm with Nick, where this is like a 51 49 to me. It has been said many times, but it to be the truth. And I went with Rue. Um, which surprised me because going into it, I was like, it's going to be Joe. Um, but Rue really did convince me by the end. It was so close um, because I'm with Mark. Like, I don't love the movie, but Joe said a lot of stuff that really made me think that um, – Alec is a great villain, but just on the edge, Rue had me that maybe it's more based on the performance and less on the actual character itself, which we've seen many times in many different films. Um, I agree with Nick that there were some like shots against that could have been taken against uh, Goldfinger that weren't taken. Uh, or that weren't uh, uh, attacked upon. Um, this was really, really close, but my gut was telling me Rue uh, when it was over, and I went with Rue. So Rue is up two to one after that one. Mark, I'm sorry you were on the edge again. Um, <laughs> so uh, with that, Rue is up two to one. We are going to move into the final prep question of the round. Joe needs to hit this in order to send it to the bonus. And the question is in the category of comedy uh, drafted by Rue. And the question is, what is the best character in a 95 to 02 Ice Cube comedy? Whoops, sorry. I didn't mean to take Joe out right away. But uh, Rue, you are going to be going first. And I know so much about these movies. So please uh, enlighten the audience so I don't have to. Rue... One minute when you start talking. There are so many great comedic characters in the Ice Cube uh, comedy, uh, but none of them reached the heights. That is Willie Jones, a.k.a. Pops from Friday. It is a legendary comic in John Witherspoon with so many quotables like uh, – uh, don't go in there for 35, 45 minutes, amongst others, uh, an iconic character that was so beloved that he follows through for decades with this character through multiple mediums culminating in uh, being pops again with uh, Sean, the Wayans brothers in White Chicks. Um, but more than that, more than the comedy that he brings that matches any other character, he brings the heart and dramatic weight and depth that makes Friday more than just a hood classic comedy. It makes it an all-time great film with which culminates in the scene that encapsulates it all. You win some, you lose some, but you live. You live to fight another day. Not only is he great comedically, not only is he heart, but he brings a dramatic weight that brings credence to Craig, which then brings credence to Smokey, which then brings credence to the entire film. Nobody's better than Pops. Pops. Let's check it from the record. Uh, we're going to move over to Joe. Joe, you have one minute when you start talking. Sometimes the best character in a movie isn't the one who goes through the biggest change or has the most profound development. Sometimes the best character is the one that sticks in the memory, the standout, the one you want to revisit. And that's why I chose Smokey from Friday. This is Chris Tucker at his comedic best. Uh, when I'm watching a comedy, the best character is usually the funniest. Smokey is a character that fully understands who he is 
uh, what he wants to do in life, which is, you know, smoke weed and to have a day off. Most of us know in the real world that isn't feasible, but Smokey doesn't care. That's what makes him great. Here's a character that makes the film come alive. He stands apart from the rest, and despite not being a lead, gives us the film's most iconic line, is the most featured character in the trailer. And I think that is one of the key points. Smokey is the selling point for this movie. You want to put your best character forefront to bring that audience in. You watch that trailer, you get very little pops and a whole lot of Smokey. Time. This is my favorite movie of all time. Thank you guys for picking characters from it. Uh, I have seen it, though. It's very good. Five minute freeform. One of you starts. You watch the movie. It ends with the character that's been the heart of the entire film telling Craig to be a man in that dramatic Debo fight that makes the film, again, more than just a comedy. Yes. Yes, Chris Tucker is his absolute best here as Smokey, but there is nothing more to him than those one-liners, than those quips. You're talking about wanting to stick with the character. You stuck with Pops for a decade after through the sequels and into other mediums and other films because he is just as iconic. John Witherspoon is just as iconic as Chris Tucker. Pops as a quotable is just as, is almost as iconic as Smokey. You hear the word bang, 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 bang. If you are in the culture or you follow comedy, you know that's Pops and John Witherspoon and you want to talk about doesn't stand apart they want to do uh friday four the problem is they don't really think they can do it because john witherspoon passed away and they're like there's no way we can do a friday without pops they replaced Smokey with day day in the following two films and he played the exact same role to almost the damn near exact same reference well, I can't speak to the sequels because I'm in them, and we're not talking about them. We're talking about what is presented in the movie. The reason you can carry on with John Witherspoon as Pops is because you're not really given enough, and there is much more to explore in there. Pops has really one note, and it's complaining. Take out the trash. Get a job. Bring me water. I mean, we're talking about a, the greatest character. We're talking about one that advocates for violence against dogs. All right, sure. It only takes um, his son actually picking up a gun for him to actually start giving some proper fatherly advice. The rest of it is just complaining. Smokey speaks his mind. He is talented. He's got, he's multilingual. He has more facets than just being quippy. You know, you don't see Pops embracing the other cultures in the neighborhood. You see Smokey do that plenty of times. You know, he's speaking Spanish to the other people in, in the neighborhood. You only see Pops in one confined location in the house dealing with Craig and occasionally Smokey. The reason I'm bringing up the replaceability of a character, because if you're able to be replaced and you're almost filling the same role, that means you're not as you're not able to do more than just uh, what Smokey does. You said that Pops is one note. Smokey is yelling. Damn. Uh, come on, man. Uh, let's smoke weed. It's the same uh, 10 that Chris Tucker is at and he does best. And there is not a scene that you can tell that he does anything more than just do that. I know that Pops is a dog catcher that loves what he does, even though he hates dogs. He is a loving husband. He is very strict, but can uh, t tell jokes. And then again, he at the end is a loving father that tells um, Craig that what he needs to do is be a man. The freaking this own channel has that scene because it is so damn palpable and great. And again, elevates it past the comedy. There is nothing that Smokey does that, uh, that is anything other than yelling, and being funny as Chris Tucker, nothing else. That whole other culture stuff doesn't, it's the same being able to do something hilarious and over the top in a different culture, in a different language. That is not deft. That is not a best character. That is funniest while Pops is just as funny, but offers more. But we're talking about a comedy here, but not just a comedy. At its heart, Friday is about a neighborhood. It is about that neighborhood, you know, but you only ever see Pops interacting with Craig and Smokey inside the house. But Smokey, he interacts with everybody. He has a moment to shine with everybody in that neighborhood because people are drawn to him as a character. And it's not just the people, the other characters that are drawn to him. The audience are drawn to him as well, which is why you put him forefront in the trailer. When you leave that movie, you are not quoting Pops, you are coming out. You are saying you got knocked the fuck out. Damn. You are saying all these things, you know, despite every good point you make about Pops, when you leave the movie, Smokey is what you're talking about. It's the counting the money. It's the 20, 40, 60, 800. Just flipping it over. 20, 40, 60, 800. You know, calling Pops hair a spider's nest, flirting with Miss Parker, the reaction to his blind date. These are the moments you quote. These are the moments you remember. 
Um, I'm sorry, but I, I don't remember Smokey saying, I like pig feet. Why every time you in the kitchen, I'm in the kitchen. In my entire life, if somebody has blown up a bathroom, they say, don't go, in, don't go in there for about 35, 45 minutes. Pops was the first one to say, how you gonna get fired? On your day off, Craig, he does everything that Smokey does. And then, then as after being the heart, after being the loving father, after being the hard working person day in and day out for his family at the end is teaching lessons, is bringing depth to a movie that could have just fallen in line with all of the other stoner comedies is nothing but just that. But Friday, Friday is an all time classic because of what Pops does throughout the film, bringing weight, bringing gra uh, uh, gravitas, bringing um, not only levity, but dramatic hefts to it, at, especially at the end to elevate Friday while Smokey elevates Chris Tucker in his comedy. One moment to shine at the end, shining a whole movie. Okay. Uh, Joe, you are closing first. You have one minute when you start talking. Uh, the reason Smokey is the better character is because he stands out and not in an annoying way. His comedy is quick-witted, fast delivery, and it has that cultural intelligence. His verbal version of slapstick comedy is no more on point in his career than throughout Friday. Those are the words of Amaro Moses versus Tyler Birch. But Smokey also gets to interact with everyone. He has more moments, has more quotable lines. He is a bigger draw to the people around him and to the audience absorbing this movie. It's just why he is front and center in the movie. He is not the lead of the movie and he is front and center in the trailer. He is the selling point. He brings people in and when you come out of it, when you are trying to sell that movie to other people, when you are talking about why was this movie so great, what made this movie so great? You are quoting Chris Tucker. You are talking about the scenes that Smokey is in because he is a character that draws you in. You look at any other movie, any other sort of comedy movie, it's who is your favorite character? It's the one that made you laugh the most. And that is what Smokey does. Pops has great moments. He has a moment to shine at the end, but doesn't cash out in the home. Shine in the home I don't know what you just said at the end there, but strike it from the record. Uh, let's go to Rue. Rue, you have one minute when you start talking. Chris Tucker shines as a comedic character the entire film. John Witherspoon matches that one with the how you gonna get fired on your day off Craig uh, scene in the bathroom, followed by the kitchen scene, fo followed by kicking uh, Smokey out when Smokey wants to uh, take a shit, followed uh, by showing that he's a loving father working hard at day to day throughout the entire uh, film. Then following up by again, ending with the scene of all scenes that makes you believe Friday is more than just a comedy. He is the best character because he matches all the comedic moments that Chris Tucker Smokey does, but he brings something more to it. He brings drama, he brings heft, he brings weight throughout the entirety of the film because you always have to come back to Pops every time you go back to the house. Every time they go back to the house, Pops comes back out and says a great one-liner or has a, uh, um, or it has a scene that makes you remind you that there is a strong family inside that house. John Witherspoon is as, as legendary as Chris Tucker. Um, and it is seen that it is a best character because you cannot replace Pops in that film. Chris Tucker was immediately replaced after because somebody else can do the same thing. Best character is more than just comedy. Right. Okay. Once again. Oof. Mark has died into the void. Man, I'm here. I'm just... <laughs> Nick, are you ready? Is it shut no. down? I didn't write anything yet. So okay, that's fair. That's fair. Really liked your guys' plan. You tried really hard for four questions, four movies. Let's have a fight. <laughs> I was going to say nothing to add to the argument, but hey, great. We picked two of the same movie on two questions. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. okay. 
I get to go first, and uh, uh, <laughs> I, I, I hate going first. I hate going last. I only like going second. Uh, it's the where I feel the most safe. Uh, <laughs> um, I went with Joe. Um, I haven't actually seen this movie. <laughs> I, I lied. You uh, and it's been on my watch list forever. Um, and I don't know. This is weird. Like, there was a wild. <sighs> okay. I don't want to say that Rue only talked about the performance because he didn't. But there was a lot where we talked about, like, how um, Chris Tucker was replaced. And I felt like that didn't matter. Um, because if the character's good, it doesn't matter if the character's replaced or not. Like, the Hulk is a cool character and he was replaced with a different actor and the character is still cool. Like it, it, that didn't really uh, bother me. And I thought that Joe did a really, really good job of explaining why his character was fun and quotable and iconic for this movie. And Rue did a great job explaining why his character was uh, great for his, for the movie as well. But I think that, Joe kind of did the same thing that Rue did for me on the action on the bad boys one where it was in the comedy, the category of comedy, like his character fits the best character in this ice cube comedy movie more just like Rue's action scene fit um, the bad boys action comedy more. So Again, it's hard when you haven't seen the movies. Nazario would say that I should have watched the movie, but uh, Nazario's crazy. So I went with Joe. Um, Mark, am I cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? I mean, I've seen this movie one time. I had a deep cut study. It not the best way to watch a movie, by the way. That's that's never is. It never is. No. Yeah. I. Weirdly enough, I didn't make that uh, comparison before. I did go with Rue on this one. I I just think in like in the case when because I feel like in general both both of the uh, both Rue and Joe made points how their characters funny in the movie, and I and I think both of them are right. They're both both their characters pick kind of funny, like have a lot of funny moments, and they brought brought them up a ton. I think. I did glom onto Rue's argument that his character elevates the movie at times and is kind of, is able to make it make the make the movie better and I think more memorable. And even though I think Joe's character I think is very memorable its own right, I do think I kind of glommed on, especially in the context of best character. I went with Rue on that one more. Okay, Nick. You're deciding it. Are we moving on to the bonus, or is the match over? I mean, probably. You know. I'm just gonna sit here in silence for about three minutes. <laughs> okay, I'll time you. Okay. It's been three minutes, Nick. Go ahead. Okay. Um, apologies right off the bat. Never seen the movie. Probably, I don't personally feel qualified to judge this. So, if I latched onto something that isn't actually accurate, uh, apologies. But you know, this is the position I'm in, so this is what I'm doing. But um, I think a lot of I think a lot of Rue's argument, at least at the beginning, I think she sort of shifted away from it. But at least at the beginning was the legacy of the character after the movie. And Joe, with one simple sentence, was said, "We're talking about the movie that they're in." Um, I think having to replace. I think I agree with what Tim said about replacing the character, though. I think he picked a bad example because what it sounded like Rue said was that they picked a new character to fill the same role as the character, not necessarily like switching the actor for the exact same character. That's um, I misunderstood. But that. I don't think that necessarily makes for a bad character, if anything. And I would have liked Joe to say this. I think that proves that the character was good if they needed someone to, if they needed a new character to come in and, and fill that spot. But that all that is to, be, to say that I, that I don't know the characters. I apologize. Joe said the character was great the whole movie. Uh, Rue had had a couple standout spots. You leave the movie talking about Joe's character, and I didn't hear anything against that, so I voted for Joe. All right. Well, so 
I know the players are probably pissed, but I love it. Joe wins a ice cube question and Rue wins a James Bond yeah. question. <laughs> this is this is gorgeous. Okay, so here's how this is gonna work. We're gonna move into the bonus round. I randomized the sides of fan zone between uh fandom and May Zone to find out which side should be used. Um and then I randomized a category from the remaining categories that weren't already drafted. So totally random. The question then was uh, concocted by myself. And then, uh, so I'm going to say the question to you. I am then going to repeat the question. Once I have said it a second time, you will be able to answer the question. Whoever goes, whoever answers first will be going first. You will each get 45 seconds and then 30 seconds. Does everyone understand the rules as I have said them? Yes. Rue, I know you love the bonus round. So uh <laughs> I think this is my uh, Rue, was it you that said that you always go to the bonus round? Like no I am what. in the I am in the bonus round every single time. Yeah, I went versus um, versus Nazario and Jacoby. So Rue, I feel you, buddy. All right. The side of fan zone that was drafted and randomized was fandom. And the category was Marvel slash MCU. And the question is simply, what is the best Marvel movie? Not MCU, but what is the best Marvel movie? Across the Spider-Verse. Okay. Logan. Okay. I'm going to take Mark and Nick off screen. I'm already wet with anticipation. Uh, so I'm going to stay on screen and I'm going to give you guys your 10 second warnings as they come up. So Rue, we are starting with you again. Rue picked across Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. Joe picked Logan. Rue, you get 45 seconds whenever you start talking. <laughs> Into the Spider Verse is a masterpiece. Across the Spider Verse, with above and beyond a masterpiece, it it, it has the dual, um, really in depth storylines of Gwen Stacy with her father and um, the story of identity of, of Miles trying to come out about something that he can't do that, and it intricately weaves all these Easter eggs and points that for the fans without making them the the point to stand on. There's so much depth in the fact that Miles is trying to come out and and finding himself in this film and the fact that the animation has um, basically changed animation for forever after Into the Spider-Verse and, and upped it. The story, the voice actors, the uh, uh, the the Easter eggs, the, the score, which is absolutely amazing. Everything about Across the Spider-Verse should have been Best Picture nominated because it's the top tier of everything that right. animation is. Animation is, strike it from the record. Joe, 45 seconds. Logan gave us a look into the X-Men world we had never seen before. This was a dark, brooding movie with a fantastic performance from Hugh Jackman and an even darker performance from Patrick Stewart. It does give you those Easter eggs, but again, it's in a way that doesn't affect the movie. If you don't have to have seen the previous ones, you just know it's this dark performance from Logan. You get this fantastic journey with this fantastic villain, this new side of Logan where he's having to take on uh, X-23 and then fight against himself. The problem with Across the Spider-Verse, it is only half a movie. It does not finish. It does We do not know what the resolution is going to be. But with Logan, you get a full start-to-finish story that gives you a proper resolution to this character and a beautiful emotional scene by the lake it's got water. Still brings me to tears every time. Oh, sorry, I thought it was the time. Still brings me to tears every single time. Patrick Stewart is beautiful. The whole story plays out perfectly. Time. Okay, Rue, 30 seconds. The Two Towers is a third of a movie and it's still one of the greatest of all time. Deadpool and Wolverine kills whatever ending Logan had. Uh, the problem with Logan, you have a villain problem. I don't remember what it, Richard E. Grant does. Uh, uh, Boyd Holbrook is way too over the top. And that damn clone, just what the fuck was that? There is absolutely... 
absolutely zero wrong with Across the Spider-Verse that you can point out. So you have to bring that half-ass thing about it's half a movie. It is a brilliant movie that ends with Gwen Stacy's story from beginning to end and then adds on the extra stuff from Miles that makes you want Beyond the Spider-Verse more than anything you ever wanted. Joe, 30 seconds. But by now with two towers, you know where it's gonna end, but you don't still know where across spider is gonna end. It could have a completely awful resolution to completely destroy this movie with Logan. You get that fantastic resolution that's been built up over all these years, but still resolves the movie that is inside. You get fantastic action sequences, the stuff in the hallway with the claws. The first time we actually see Logan taking on people and give and actually blood is actually coming out. It's the first time, it's the one of the darkest X-Men movies that you can get. It's a fantastic, you get fantastic performances all around, an emotional story, an emotional journey, that final rage, that final Logan rage going through the woods is superb, better than anything in the right. Fuck you guys. <laughs> uh, <Okay>. uh, <laughs> yeah, right? Good, like, God. good shit. You guys literally like said all the things that I was gonna be like. If they said this, they would win it for me. Um, God damn it! Um, I I need another minute. I'm sorry. I'm still processing. I can't make the same facial reactions on screen that I do off screen during the main fight. Um, So I'm not processing the same way. Um, Yeah. Okay. Hey, Rue, you want to just talk about Friday or something? Yeah. Y'all need to watch that movie. I know. It's been on my watch list forever. It's not on the same Rue, I was generally worried this would only go to question. That would be the third. The Friday question would be question three. You'd already be two up. You'd beat me and you'd just get to look at me and go, you got knocked the fuck out. And I'd yeah. be like, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. Mark yeah. and Nick, are you guys ready? Yeah. Nick, you're going first. No. Okay. <laughs> Nick, you're going. Okay. Um, at the end of the day, it was pretty simple for me. Um, there was really no knocks against either movie. So as cheap of a knock as it was, I had to go with the one that made the most sense to me, which is that it's not a complete story without a resolution and a lot of ruse. Like The only knock I heard against... Uh, Logan was that Deadpool and Wolverine is going to make it irrelevant. At least the only one that like held any weight with me. I, I don't know. This was tough. Apologies. What a job. All right. Well, I said going second is my happy place, but this is um, I think the closest um, Nick said this. It was simple for him. Twas not simple for old Timmy. Um, I think that the the hits against each other was where I kind of had to look at, but at the same time, each person's pros for their movies were so good. Um, and kind of different too. Like Joe was very much on like, like I thought that the point at the end that he said, like, this is the first time we see Logan actually like stab someone and blood comes out and how satisfying that is. Um, and how intense the ending is. 
um, the full resolution of that story and the great performances, the darkness of the movie while still being just a fantastic film. And on the other side, Rue talking about how um, I thought his hit against the, because I literally said to myself, like, Joe needs to bring up how this isn't a whole movie. Like he just has to, if he doesn't, that's a, but I thought Rue countered it in a pretty good way of the two towers thing. I thought that was a great point. He, he played to my sensibilities 100% by bringing up Lord of the Rings. Um, and I thought Rue did great by talking about Gwen Stacy and her story and everything like, and, um, and bringing up like, even because we're just talking about movie, it doesn't have to be specifically plot and characters. He brought up the score and the animation and how it's like been game changing. I thought that adds a lot. Um, but I went with Joe and Joe's, um, it, it did at the end of the day kind of end up being, and I don't think it was on purpose in the sense that like, I thought Rue did a good job of combating the half a movie, or I'm sorry. I thought Rue did a good job of combating the half a movie thing. And that that shouldn't count. But the tiny little added thing of Joe being like, yeah, but like, we knew where this was go, where Lord of the Rings was going. We have no idea what they're doing with the third one. It could totally be bullshit. Um, and again, it was such a small thing, but adding on top of all of the other positive things that each player said about their movies i had to kind of grasp onto something it was tough it took me a long time to come to a decision but i did go with joe mark your vote doesn't count where would you have gone and why <laughs> god damn it um you know uh, i um the guys it was really close um, pretty much essentially where it came from me, I think every for each point somebody brought up, there was a good counterpoint to it. The only real uh, thing that I glommed on to here was Rue brought up the point of the villains in Logan being kind of weak. Joe didn't have a, really an answer for that. For that reason, I went with Rue. That's fair. Uh, but with that being said, your winner is Joe Fairly. We are going to move into post-match interviews. Rue, we're going to start by talking to you. I have a couple of questions for you. This match airs in uh, like a week. <laughs> it airs on the 15th of April, so a little over a week. Um, I know you have some other stuff going on, so I want to know. You're a busy guy. You're playing some other matches coming up, but I know you still like to win and you want to get you want to get that win against Joe and move on in this. But are you upset? Are you happy because you can you know focus on other stuff? Like what what kind of is your mindset coming out of this? And I should say as well, this is kind of as close as it gets. It's three to two, and every single question was a split decision. There was not one clean sweep across the whole game. So this is literally as close as it can get. Um, how are you feeling, man? I'm a little frustrated because um, I legit was like, did I cut out with my villain point? Because neither of you two mentioned it. And I was like, wait a sure. second. Because he closed. And I was like, because I I, I, while he was closing, I was like, he didn't touch on it. Cool. That should That should do it. And then he brought it up. I was like, no, I didn't cut out. Okay, then. Sure. Uh, and then secondly, um, this is something I'll never stop doing. But me bringing black movies into it and then that becoming a disadvantage because people don't watch it and know it consistently. I will never stop doing that. But, man, it hurts every time something comes up. I was like, oh, no, if you'd have just seen the film. Oh, um, props to Joe because I swore I was going to um, – I swore I was going to, if I was going to steal one, I was going to steal the Edgar Wright one. Uh, I didn't think I was going to steal the Bond one. And I had no idea whether or not I was taking that or not. So I was very like, oh, okay, cool. Um, 
little frustration, but it is what it is. I will always come back. I put in as much work as I do for this as my other things that I got going on right now as well. Uh, and I was ready for it. Um, but I'm not going to lie. I told you I'll always be up that last one. That, that, one, that one's a little frustrating, but it, again, it is what it is. I can't wait to come back. Real. I've been there. Uh, we've all played, well, actually Mark's never played this game, uh, but we've all played this game. Mark's been around a lot of these games. So we've all had those questions. So I totally understand your frustration. It's totally valid to feel frustrated. And uh, I too have been known to bring a movie or two that no one has seen. Uh, so I, I understand where you're coming from there, but I promise you I'll watch Friday. Um, Rue, I think you did really great today. Again, this is like as close as a match can get. I think you played fantastic. This is honestly like contender level worth matches and you will be back. We will be seeing you again. So I can't wait to see it, but go prep for those other things. I'm looking forward to seeing what else you're doing around the multiplex. Thank you, Rue. As we bring in Joe Fairley, Joe, you won the match. Um, you've had, you've been having a pretty good season, Joe. You went up against Richard Schwartz in your first match, and you won him, You won against him pretty handedly. Uh, then you went up against uh, Jack Pinchuk, won against him pretty handedly, and then won in a pretty close match against Jacoby, who went on to challenge for the belt. Now you beat Rue, so you're on a really, really good, uh, a really, really good season so far. How are you feeling about this matchup, though? I think out of everyone that I've played so far, Rue is definitely the one I've been closest with. I've known the longest. It does sting a little bit because every time I see Rue play, I do root for him. I do cheer him on. I think we did benefit. I think the disadvantage, at least it came from a place where we were both arguing a point from the same movie that two of the judges hadn't seen. So that was a little bit more of a leveler. Um, but yeah, if these have got to stop going to sudden death on a work night. Like this is <laughs> like, I, I like, I like the prep that goes into it. And then you get the sudden death question. I'm like, ah, no prep. Cause I can, you know, try and memorize a Sean Bean quote. And when there's plenty of prep time <laughs> and like, I heard, like I said, I heard that villain argument and I was like, ah, oh, let's mention the fact that they've got two villains and you know, that, and I just, it just completely went out of my head when my 30 seconds started, just went. That's fair. Joe. You're moving on in this tournament. Uh, you beat Rue. And now your next opponent, I think, in my opinion, equally as exciting. Um, either way, I think this is going to be a great fight. You're going to be going up against either the eight seed, Caleb Coho, or the one seed, someone you've played before, Kurt Kolkowski. Your thoughts. Kirk's movie tastes are very different to mine. What? No. Makes it for an interesting debate. But I've never debated Coho. So. It's not fun. I can tell you that. No, but I've seen all the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, you see. That's true. Multiple times. Thanks, guys. No, they're <laughs> great. I love them. Um, <laughs> the first three. So, yeah, I, I think when I, I think. Kurt maybe one of my very early matches when I very first sort of came into fan zone, like one of my first. And yeah, I think my game's come on since then. So um be interesting for a rematch, you know, see if I can up my game to that level. Okay. Uh sorry, I just got a text that I was looking at. Um, <laughs> so uh family related. So Joe, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're gonna do next. Thanks for being here tonight. Great match. Uh, let's get final thoughts, starting with Nick. Uh, people said some things. I judged. Uh, winner was declared. Fan zone. Yeah, Mark, thoughts from you. What if I just said the exact same thing? <laughs> uh, the that was a good match. I, I, I enjoyed it very. Uh, I did think it was interesting because a lot of times, you know, I just get put in these green rooms. I honestly don't really look at the questions or the answers till you know, they get here. And, you know, just seeing, oh, we're arguing a lot of the same stuff is kind of fun to watch that. Um, yeah, I mean, Joe has, I think, picked up his game a lot in the um, last couple months. Whoever he plays next, I think it'd be very interesting. And Rue is still... Still brings it every time. I know uh, 
next time he comes back, he will bring it again. Absolutely. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight at Fans on Debate. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Have a great night. There we go. Thank you very much. Please come again. We have a lot more groceries.